The Lord be with you. I am so glad that you can join us in this Bible study as we look together at Romans chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. As we look at these verses, we're doing so within a time and a culture when sincerity is prized very highly, when we put a very high premium on sincerity and authenticity. We want people to be themselves, to keep it real. Be you, right? We want people to be authentic. And we disparage them when they're not. We don't like hypocrites. We don't want anyone to be fake or to be showy. We want authenticity. But what the Holy Spirit shows us in Romans 10 is that we could also be sincerely wrong. Sincerely wrong. Because sincerity is good. Sincerity is good. But ser sincerity is not good enough to make us right with God. And what you need and what I need above anything else is to be made right with a holy and righteous God. So let's read together Romans chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. Paul says, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Sincerity is good, but what is insufficient and lacking about sincerity? At least two things. The first is that sincerity is insufficient to save us from God's judgment against our sin. Paul is speaking about his fellow Israelites, his fellow Jews, and he's speaking with all kinds of empathy because he knows exactly where they are. And he used to think and he used to live exactly as they think and live. And he says, it's my heart's desire, my prayer to God, that they may be saved. They need to be saved. But it's not that they're not zealous for God. They are very zealous. They're very religious. They're passionate about God. And that's good. But it's not based on knowledge. Sincerity is not sufficient to save us from God's judgment. And we don't like to think about God's judgment. And most preachers don't like to talk about God's judgment. But the reality is that if God is to be righteous and holy, then he also has to have wrath against what is wrong and what is sinful. And we don't take any delight in talking about it, but we need to tell the truth because God has spoken truly about himself. And while we tend to be very good at rationalizing our way out of God's judgment against us or against the people we love and care about, we all, to a certain extent, want there to be justice in the world. We want there to be punished for, for people who do what is wrong. We all want that. We want there to be justice in the universe and in this world. And we would say it would be wrong of God to not be just, to not do what is right. But we get a lot more uncomfortable when that judgment is directed at our shortcomings and at our sins. But it is. The other reason we're uncomfortable about it is because we use the wrong yardstick to evaluate ourselves and other people. We use a horizontal yardstick to measure ourselves instead of a vertical yardstick. We look around at other people and we say, well, I'm better than that person. Or I certainly haven't made the mistakes that she made. And we think that somehow we're more deserving, that we're better before God than someone else. And we're zealous. But when we measure ourselves vertically before a righteous and holy God... Well, no one measures up. No one is righteous. 
We all have fallen short of the glory of God, as Paul says in Romans 3.23. Everyone, Jew, Gentile, everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. And that applies to you no matter how sincerely you hold your beliefs. But so often Christians and people who go to church think that people who don't go to church, people who belong to a different religious community, people who have no religious beliefs whatsoever, we sometimes stereotype them and think that those people need to repent. And and we stereotype sinners as people who have made unwise decisions or who are addicted to something and they need to repent and they need to trust Christ and they're living a, a bad lifestyle. But then when we go out in the world and we meet our neighbor across the street or next door and we meet our coworker, we think, well, they're just as sincere about what they think and what they believe as we are. They're just as sincere and authentic and real about their beliefs as we are. And sometimes we stumble here and we think, well, I don't see how they need to repent. They're a good person. They're a good person just like I'm a good person but we're using the wrong yardstick. We don't measure ourselves and we don't measure other people against the yardstick of the best in humanity. We measure ourselves and other people against the yardstick of God's word. And what God has said is holy and right and righteous. And when we use that yardstick, there is nothing in us, no matter how sincere, no matter how authentic and real we are, that can save us from God's judgment against our sins. We can't wiggle our way out of that. We can't rationalize our way out of that. We deserve God's judgment for all the things that we've said we shouldn't have said, for the things that we should have said that we didn't say, the things we've done that we shouldn't have done, the things we left undone that we should have done. We are all guilty before God's judgment seat. And sincerity cannot save us from God's judgment. That's the first reason sincerity is insufficient. It cannot make us right with a holy God. But the second reason is that sincerity is insufficient to satisfy the demands of God's righteousness, what God defines as righteous and holy. Paul says, for I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. They are passionate, but their passion, their zeal is not based on knowledge. And that knowledge comes down to knowing the person who perfectly lived out God's righteousness. Verse three, since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Any human human effort to try to establish righteousness, to prove ourselves either before God or according to some moral standard, will always fall short. And we need to be really clear that there are atheists and there are agnostics who are totally sincere in what they believe. And we need to commend that. That's good. That's good. It's just, it's not good enough to satisfy the demands of God's righteousness. This is a holy and righteous God who is perfect in everything he does and everything he says. And we can't measure up. But for the atheist, for the agnostic who's sincere in his or her belief, well, it's not like they don't have morals. It's not like they don't have ethics. They are trying to live out what they believe to be right and wrong, they do have standards. And those standards have to be derived from the things in this world, from what popular opinion says or what the best of human philosophy can come up with because they can't acknowledge that God has revealed and said this is what is right and wrong. But they're sincere, they're authentic, they're real. That's good. That's good. But none of that can satisfy what God says is right and wrong. Only one person does that. There's no idea, there's no philosophy, there's no worldview, there's no action, there's no organization or institution that can do this. There is only one person, and that person 
is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the one sent by God the Father to show us how a human life is supposed to be lived. He treated everyone as God would want them to be treated. He said true things and he obeyed God. He lived a life of submission before God the Father. But oh, how we hate that word, submit. Everything in us, in our humanity, our, our human pride, chafes at that. Submit? No, no. We don't want to submit to anyone or to anything. But in order to know this righteousness and this righteous one, Jesus Christ, we must be willing to submit to what God has said is righteous. Because there's only one person who has ever lived and who will ever live, who perfectly satisfied the demands of God's righteousness. And that person is not you and it's not me. But Paul's saying they're, they're setting their sights on something that's good, but they're going about it the wrong way. And we could use the illustration of, of here in Raleigh, if you want to go to Eastern North Carolina and enjoy the beach, well, that's good. But if you turn west and go toward the mountains, well, you're never going to get there, are you? If you try to live righteously, if you try to live a holy life without going through the gate that God has established, his son, Jesus Christ, the only one who is perfect and righteous, well, you're never going to get there. You're never going to get there. And God has made it very clear that he is the only righteous one, as we read in Romans 3, verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. The Old Testament is pointing to Jesus and the coming of Jesus. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified, all are declared righteous freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus Christ. This is vitally important to understand what Christianity is about, what the gospel is about, because God is just, God is righteous, and God cannot just sweep your sin or my sin underneath the rug. He can't just hide it. He can't just overlook it. He can't just pretend like we haven't sinned against him. So what does he do? How can he be just and punish sin and yet forgive sinners like you and like me? How can he bridge that gap? The answer is Jesus. Jesus lived the life that you haven't lived and that I haven't lived and that we could never possibly live. He lived that life and he went to the cross. He absorbed God's judgment, God's punishment against your sin and my sin in his body on the cross by shedding his precious blood for you, for sinners, and for me. So that now God can be just and he can justify sinners. He is righteous and he can declare sinners to be righteous, not on the basis of anything that they have done or said, but entirely and wholly on the basis of what Jesus has done for them in their place, in your place and in my place. Jesus Christ is the culmination of the law for everyone who believes, the culmination. And the word the NIV is translating as culmination is telos, end. And telos has the same meaning in Greek as it does in English. We can say, well, that's the end of the story, meaning that's the termination point. But it can also mean the end toward which we're moving, the goal toward which we're moving. And it seems that 
Paul is especially referring to that second sense here. Christ is the fulfillment, the culmination, the goal toward which the law of God has always been pointing. And giving the law, the Old Testament, to his people, God was showing them, I'm righteous, and this is what it looks like to live righteously before me. But, as we've seen, the law holds out righteousness, but it can't give righteousness. It is God's standard, but it cannot make sinners righteous. Only one person can do that, Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Do you know him? Now, someone will say, okay, so you're saying that no matter how sincere that atheist or that agnostic or that Muslim or that Buddhist neighbor, whoever it is, no matter how sincere they are, that that sincerity is not good enough to make them right with God. That's not good enough to save them from God's judgment. That's not good enough to satisfy the demands of God's righteousness. Yes, yes, that's what I'm saying because that's what the Holy Spirit is saying through the Apostle Paul in Romans 10. But someone will say to me, well, that's so close-minded. How can you think that way? How can you just put God in that box? That's so small. Look, I can't be any more open-minded than Christ authorizes me to be. Why? Because my soul, my heart, my life belongs to Jesus. My conscience belongs to Jesus. He purchased me with his very own life by the shedding of his own blood. And he's sent his Holy Spirit to live inside of me now. How then can I say, no, Jesus, you're too close-minded. That's wrong. Because I don't believe what I believe just because I'm small-minded or close-minded. I believe it because of what Jesus said. He says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I didn't say that. Jesus did. And you see the same thing with his apostles, those who heard him, who walked with him. Acts 4, 12, salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven, given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only way to be saved from God's judgment against our sin and to satisfy the demands of God's righteousness. There is no other way. Yes, this is exclusive. Yes, this is hard. Yes, this is unpopular. Yes, it's uncomfortable to say that or to hold that belief in the midst of this world. But if it's true, then we can't depart from it. If we belong to Jesus, then he's Lord, and we take him at his word. So what do you say about Jesus right now? Who is he to you? I hope you're sincere. I hope you're authentic. I hope you're real. Those are all good things. But what you're reaching for, what you're longing for, can't be found in anyone else or in anything else. Jesus is the answer. He is the goal of human life. He is the goal of God's world and God's creation. He is God's answer. Do you know him as Lord? Are you living for him or not? In the Gospel of Mark, we're told about an individual who comes up to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do, what do I do? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Obey the law. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack. Is Jesus saying that to you today? That's great. You're sincere. You're passionate. You have a cause. That's wonderful. But one thing you lack. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Jesus is saying, whatever it is, if it's your wealth, if it's your family, if it's your job, if it's your career, whatever it is, whatever is keeping you from wholeheartedly submitting to me as Lord and as Savior. 
you got to get rid of that and come follow me. But at this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Do you lack one thing? I pray that this day, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what you haven't done, I pray that this day, the Holy Spirit would speak to you and would bring you to Christ to see him as Lord and as Savior, as your righteousness before a holy and righteous God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we confess before you that our good intentions, our best efforts, our sincerity, it's not enough. We think it's enough and we act like it's enough and we live as though it's enough, but we confess, Lord, that it's not. We confess that there is only one way, there is only one person who is capable of saving us. There is only one person who perfectly lived the human life. We confess that his name is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so I pray, Lord, for everyone hearing this message, that we would all trust in him, that we would see him as our only hope, as our only way to be made right with you not because of anything we have done or said, but entirely because of what he did on the cross for us and because of what you did in raising him from the dead. We confess him as Lord. But as we confess that, Lord, we know that there are so many friends, loved ones, coworkers, neighbors, people we love and care about who are sincere, who want good things, who are pursuing good and right things. And so I pray that we, with the Apostle Paul, would pray for them, that it would be our heart's desire for them to be saved. Forgive us, Lord, for not praying enough for the salvation of our family, the salvation of our coworkers and our neighbors. We pray for anyone and anyone who does not know you as Lord and Savior, that they would be saved. And the only way any of us can be saved by your grace and through faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We offer all these things in his holy and precious name. Amen. We're so glad you could join us today. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube, like and follow us on Facebook. If you have any ministry needs or questions, reach out by email. Have a wonderful week.